Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Elite Rugby SNC podcast. First off, if you haven't already, sign up and join the Elite Rugby program. We provide all your strength, conditioning, speed, and recovery needs. You can try before you buy. So we have a seven day, $7 trial to get a taste of what we have to offer here at Elite Rugby SNC. So take your game to the next level, become a beast, and join our community. G'day, Ben. How are you today? Yeah, really good. Thank you, Kieran. How are you? I am going well, thank you. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about lower body training. So first off, what does a lower body program look like for rugby athletes? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I guess you fundamentally have to look at why you do uh, strength training, whether it's upper body or lower body. So it, it can go down several tracks. Um, first of all, you've got to think that hopefully you increase strength, which increases resilience and also increases the ability to be strong in contact or increases your ability to produce power or lays the foundations for you to build those things going along. So what does it look like for a rugby player? Um, different positions have different needs, but well, there's one thing that every rugby player needs to be able to do, that's run. And also be a strong in body positions that are good for contact, whether that's you tackling or breaking contact or holding in positions to stop people that are actually trying to clean out uh, you. And if you move towards the forwards, well, they've got isometric contractions that they have to use in scrums. So lower body training in rugby is uh, very comprehensive. You've actually got to look after the full range, full gambit, unlike other sports. It's, um, yeah, it's a big puzzle to get put together really well. Um, mm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think you, you've answered it quite well in just saying, well, a rugby program has got to cover off many different different aspects. They've got to be strong. They've got to be powerful. Forwards and, and scrums have got to be isometrically strong and be able to hold that scrum position for a, a long time. And, yeah, it's just it's just a re really unique program that I think a lot of other sports don't really get to, to touch on is just targeting all those different aspects. And, yeah, I can't really say anything more than that. It's But besides for the program, we're, we're trying to get weapons. So that's our, like our squat and deadlift. We're trying to really produce force and power and then but we also got to make sure that we're making each uh, area resilient and robust so more like your rdl um, type of thing making those hamstrings nice and ro robust as well so you can't just focus on being strong and powerful all the time you got to be make sure that your athletes are resilient and if something tricky happens out there on the field they're able to um, overcome that and and stay healthy as well yeah I guess if we could sum that up, I think we're very similar there. It's um, the ability to transfer what you do in the gym to a performance outcome or a protective outcome in some type of resilience mm. for a rugby player. So basically so that they can train more and play more and mm. you know, last longer in a game. Yep. So should players in different positions focus on certain lifts more than others? Yes, um, it, towards the so the end of the preseason, or as you move up the the chain in terms of getting more elite. Um, but to start with, you should start with developing a really good base and having an understanding and a wide sort of, and I like to call it an exercise vocabulary. So you should be very uh, strong and have a foundational knowledge in a variety of lifts, um, so that you can form your specialization later. Why I say that is the position that you usually start, um, say, in sport to say in rugby, even through when you leave school, it will not usually, unless you're super specialised, like a second row or a prop, um, you can actually change positions. So even within the backs, with even within the forwards, how, where you start does not mean where you'll be at the elite end. Uh, most, a lot of elite centres and tens actually end up outside backs at the next level. Mm. Right. So, yes, um, you need variety in what you need to do um, and so that later on you can specialise. And, um, and everyone has unique biomechanics, so that plays a little bit of a role later down the track, but you need a good foundation. Yeah, totally. And it just brings me to yesterday when I was watching the Brumbies trial game against the Waratahs, the commentators were saying that Scotty Seo 
when he finished year 12, he was actually number eight. And then he made the transition to prop. So it's just like you said, having a good foundational um, vocabulary of exercises. And then slowly when you're working your way up to um, with increasing your training um, years and experience, that's when you can really focus on more lifts than others so say for tight five once they've got a higher training age we're really honing down on that squat whereas back maybe we go more bulgarian uh split squat as well but yeah it's just a really interesting point that you brought that up and it just reminded me uh yesterday when i was watching the trial game yeah exactly like you were a you were a five eight weren't you and ended up a prop yes for some reason that happened i'm not too sure why but <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, so moving on to bilateral versus unilateral, are there certain ratios you're focusing on when programming and do you prefer one that over the other? Yeah, so that's, that's probably the crust of it. That's a really good, um, question there. Um, yeah, I, as you probably remember with the upper body, I do prefer ratios, um, and those ratios sort of change based on your position. So this is my belief. Um, fundamentally, you have to be strong on one leg. You, you, you just have to be because you're going to change direction, sprint and so forth. Okay, so that single leg strength is important. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not doing bilateral. That's really important as well. But if you fundamentally aren't strong on one leg, it doesn't matter how much uh, uh, bilateral work you do, you, you won't get that true transfer. So the ratios that I like to look at is um, around your single leg to double leg type of work, um, making sure that that's in really good balance and you're not dominated, say, in your push pattern. You probably will do a little bit more bilateral, but you've got to make sure you've got doing that single leg work. Um, with hamstrings, particularly because it's running base, um, if I could only choose one, I'm probably going to use unilateral and have bilateral in there because foot strike, all of those different positions, that's when your hamstring is working. So I do like to have a balance. Um, and that changes based as you get more elite on the position you play, the more high speed running you get, we're going to transfer some of those balances to different areas. But if you're not strong on, uh, you know, single leg squat or single leg hamstring work, um, it, you won't get the benefit from your bilateral really strength. Mm, totally. What's your views? Yeah, I would say it sort of comes back to what we spoke about before. It's say at the start of the preseason or the off season, we're going to be using our, our, our bilateral movements. So just like, for example, our squat. And then once we're getting a bit more specific towards the preseason, that's where the unilateral for me is really dominating um, outside of the tight five, those tight five. I do want them to be strong bilaterally in that, in those movements, but I'm a big fan of unilateral movements. Um, I love doing low box step ups with really heavy weight. And if you looked at the our Instagram page um, over the last couple of days, you would have seen some of my some of the rugby athletes uh, step doing step ups for eight reps each side of 120 kilos, which is re really impressive. Like if I was to do that, I would struggle a bit. I'm still around the 90 kg to 100, and that's really challenging for me. So. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoy doing unilateral just because it challenges them a lot more as well. Being on that one leg, you can't lift with an ego either on a squat and a deadlift. You can lift with your ego on a, like a, a just a, a, a step up. It's, it's really forcing you to stay really strong and forcing you to, to, to be strong in your core as well. Because if you're not able to control yourself, you're going to be moving around a bit. So I would definitely say I program probably a good one-to-one -one ratio, but towards the end season, it's looking like a two-to-one for most positions because I really want them strong on that, on that single leg for all those reasons that you just listed before. Yeah, and look, I use um, a lot of single leg work um, as warm-ups before bilateral work. I think that works really well. Um, one thing I have noticed when you, you're going super elite um, it is nervous system gets a little bit fried. So I've actually ended up changing in season, doing a lot of uh, doing the single leg stuff as warm ups and really targeting those areas, but keeping like the bilateral as your weapon, just because mm -hmm. um, the amount of K's and so forth and damage that you're getting through your body, trying to get through some unilateral exercises 
um, because you're basically adding in another set. So if you're doing four sets, uh, it tends it ends up being eight sets, doesn't it? Because you've got mm. four sets of five. So I tend to just judging on people like, um, am I going to fry their nervous system? Like, so they can't run this afternoon. Yeah. For a club level or a developing athlete, that's a very different story. Yeah, totally. And then, again, just comes back to uh, the post that we I posted the other day. Um, Jimmy was a bit uh, out of breath towards the end of his last eight reps. <laughs> so um, we can definitely imagine trying to do that in season, like halfway through the season is, is definitely very challenging for the athletes. So it's definitely playing around with it and, and knowing your athletes and getting them to know their bodies and, and changing it up from unilateral to bilateral. It's not saying that bilateral doesn't have a place because it does. Both of them do have a, a time and a place. It's just making sure that you're really smart about your programming. Yeah, and even um, I'm just thinking when you've got a sore back sometimes going down to unilateral and taking that load off your back, but you still, the amount of strength that you can actually put through the lower body is greater than, you know, mm. what we, you get with the bilateral too. So that's something that really helps too. When mm. you're sore in different areas, you can always revert back to get uh, that intensity in your lower body that you need. Mm, totally. So still talking about ratios, is there a ratio that you like to do for anterior versus posterior for the lower body? Yeah, for me, um, I tend to like to, a one-to-one, basically, is the way I like to look at it. Um, and the reason for that uh, is a lot of the time we might get more posterior chain um, work done, say, with your sprinting or sled drags and that type of work or banded acceleration work actually getting a lot more posterior work done if you're not doing that i'd probably lean to a touch more posterior chain work um for you your more dynamic type of athletes that you'd need that for for their positions but i find a one-to-one so so unilateral work whether it's push work which is quad dominant or knee dominant uh unilateral to bilateral one-to-one um so you're looking at posterior chain again so single leg and double leg uh, in that ratio of what you would have for your push pattern. I find quite good. If I could drop one of those things on time, I've actually dropped a lot of the bilateral uh, posterior chain and gone for a lot more single leg posterior chain um, just to actually pick up the ratios of the posterior chain from left to right. I find if you do that a lot of the time, you make a, a big difference versus, say, someone that's doing massive RDLs, but you'll find that um, when you look at them, their hips might rotate a little bit and one hamstring tends to be doing a lot more of that work. So you can actually, similar to a squat, you think sometimes one leg ends up doing a lot of the work. That's why you get to do some single leg work to find out that um, asymmetry and balance and try and work on that. I find that's pretty similar with the hamstring as well. Mm-hmm. How about you? What ratios are you working with at the moment? Yeah, I'd say it's 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 probably the same, just that one-to-one, making sure that if we're doing a squat pattern, that we're doing some type of hinge pattern as well. So just to make sure that we're a nice, well-balanced program. And yeah, I can't really say too much else than that. It's just making sure that's evenly based, targeting them in different um, movement patterns as well. So targeting them more eccentrically or isometrically as well in those different patterns and yeah, just, just trying to challenge the athlete as well, but obviously making sure that you understand what they're doing out, out on the field and um, making sure that it's not overdoing it or underdoing it in the gym as well. Yeah. Nice. So moving on to force and power production, are you prescribing more Olympic lifting or weighted jumps or a combination of both in your programming? Yeah, that's a really good question. So if, uh, if I was actually with someone, I, I definitely feel comfortable with doing some modified Olympic lifts. So like your hand cleans, power cleans, uh, uh, pull cleans, same snatches and so forth, those are variants. If I'm not there coaching so much, I definitely lean towards some more jumping activities. Um, and honestly, you get similar outcomes. Okay, if it's done well, I just find the jumping, you transfer over is uh, a little bit quicker um, and it's a little bit easier to coach. Okay. Um, why, if I'm in you know, say one-to-one relationship with someone in terms of their coaching or a smaller group, why I do Olympic lifts is 
you know, they, they're expected to be able to do them in a proper program. So if you, that's more, yes, we want you to develop power, but we want you to look like you belong when you get to that level as well. So, but that's mm -hmm. a, a longer term project that we chip away. For true transfer quickly, I lean towards more jumping to get that, um, get you actually that transfer and the inference of that transfer quicker. Mm. How about you? Yeah, I totally agree. So if I have athletes in front of me, I'm going to teach them how to Olympic lift for those reasons of I want them to to progress to the next level and be able to and be competent in those movements. So one, they don't have to take a big learning curve once they get to that higher level. And two, also to help out that coach as well. So if they're pretty technical sound, they just fit nicely into that program. But I am doing a combination of both, um, making sure that's with a barbell or with a trap bar or some dumbbells with the weighted jumps, challenging the athletes and yeah, just using both and really making sure if they are doing the, the Olympic lifts, we're trying to get that full front rack position in a, um, and absorb that load. I think that's really a good benefit for Olympic lifting is because they're, they're learning how to then take a load to their body and then absorb it. And then also you can't hide with your shoulder health as well. If you can't get that front rack position, it's probably some mobility issues that we've got to work on and making sure that we're solving those problems. Um, and yeah, I, th I think it's a good thing for, for me as a coach just to know, yeah, okay, your shoulder health isn't probably the best. Let's work on that. But with the loaded jumps, it's just a great way to, just to tell people to go hard and be fast as well. Just to be, let's just yeah. put heaps of power. You just have to jump. It's simple. It's not overly complicated compared to Olympic lift. Um, and it's just, again, it's another tool to enhance that power and force output. Yeah, yeah. I think probably a good way of thinking about it and what you've done there is you can create really good intent quickly. Mm. With um, Olympic lifts, you have to learn how to do it. Probably where in season, um, like the, the catching becomes a little bit hard because uh, people hurt their fingers, their wrists and their shoulders and so forth. And they're um, at the elite level, they have to take a lot of contact in training as well. Mm. So that's where we you'd sometimes you steer them away from the catch because their force absorption is happening in a different way. Yeah. But in a say uh, a setting where that's not happening, definitely agree with you that um, if you can get them to actually properly front rack, it's, it will set you up quite well for that ability to absorb force and uh, have healthy shoulders. Mm, totally. So still going on with the force application, do you think athletes focus too much on the vertical, which is for our listeners just going straight up instead of the horizontal, which is then jumping out in front of you? Yeah, um, for me personally, definitely. I think uh, it's pretty easy to do vertical-based stuff. You think uh, in terms of box squats, which you know have a little bit of transfer there, vertical, um, or you're squatting, or you're jumping in that way. But we play um, rugby as a horizontal power sport, so it's actually a horizontal collision that you're doing. Um, you might be trying to slightly change your direction so that you don't take some of that collision at a full-on period but it's a horizontal power sport. Um, yes, people infer that if you get stronger in that direction, you'll get stronger that way. The biomechanical setup of those angles is quite different. Okay. Mm. Yeah, you've made the muscular uh, areas around their lower body and lower back and core strong, but have you created the ability to have locomotion and balance as you're trying to display that um, horizontal force? So, I'd say there's a w real weakness in doing that. And, and how do you do it? That's, that's a bit of an art form there. So, so your sled pushes, your sled pulls. I do prefer a lot of banded work where, you know, band on one shoulder in those running positioning, tackling positions. Again, because I find that there's really good transfer and intent. Um, and as you run out, the band tension increases. So similar to contact when you uh, come here and you make contact, it actually gets harder and harder. So rather than having this steady force, you've actually got to create more force in that contact to keep becoming that inertia. So mm. hopefully that answers your question. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and, and for our listeners as well, it's something that we can definitely show you is those banded um, tackling drills and pilfering drills uh, in the future. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think horizontal 
so our broad jumps and all that do ne- do get neglected and it's probably something that athletes just don't really think about either if they're training by themselves and haven't been in an snc program before is they just focus on yeah the squats and just jumping up straight up in a counter movement jump or a box jump and i think sleds are highly underused i think it's an awesome tool if you have access to it to be able to do some sled marches to be moving that sled with high intent and even just doing sled drags as well i think just using the sled as mike boyle um snc coach over there in the states he says sleds are the um horizontal olympic weightlifting like um i think he uses a term like that so if you for all our rugby athletes listening and any other sport as well definitely focus on the horizontal um, aspect and don't just focus on the... Um, yeah, the um, definitely. Uh, a way I've actually gone and created some really cheap sleds before. So you go into a hardware store and you'll see that um, they uh, basically um, you can buy containers and they're made for wheelbarrows, right? They're plastic ones and they actually have the, the bolt positions at the top there and the bolt positions in the bottom. And they're plastic and have a smooth bottom. So the bolt positions on the top, you can actually put a rope in, put the handle out. So for the price of five ten dollars, you can make a sled. Okay, get a rope, and they can go on any surface, whether it's grass, indoor, whatever it is. So once, oh, I think it was about twelve years ago, I just went and took a hundred bucks, got ten sleds to the club so that we could train. So there's some options out there if you're really keen, or you get an old tire, you'll find a way. So we'll probably have to provide videos on that as well. Ben's D, DUI, you know, um, do it yourself, uh, how to make sleds and also use the, um, the tires as well. Tires is, is probably a good one as well. You can easily put some weight and dumbbells into that and make it heavy. We might call it the tight ass sled video. <laughs> yeah. You don't, don't want to spend too much money. Do it this way. That's good. It's, it's really good for our <laughs> listeners. So moving on from that, uh, what muscle groups are often not worked out during lower body programs that you think often get neglected? Yeah, that's a really good question. You can think of some of the work that you, you have to do and it's become popular. So your lateral hip type of work, um, it, obviously that becomes a weakness um, and that can be from like those wash hip lock positions and so forth. Um, yeah, it, a lot of work around preparing your calves. So that can be calf conditioning or even isometric work or even the the spring ability of your calves, Um, particularly if you're not doing a lot of drilling exercises. In the program we're doing, we're doing a lot of drilling and we're doing some foot conditioning, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, Some other work too, I know a lot of people look at um, bringing in, say, Copenhagen's and that type of work. I've been uh, learned a lot of lessons from other people when they brought them in. Uh, if you're doing a lot of squat work and change of direction, you probably don't need as much. They, when you introduce them, they can create a problem. So you've got to be careful when you're doing some isometric work on um, basically assistant uh, muscle groups that stabilise. So bring that in slowly. Um, I think a lot of it is actually around the core as well. The ability to use their core while they're using their lower body is, is something that um, people don't get taught how to do well as well. And what's your so that, so that would be the the just the ability to brace properly would, would you say yeah absolutely ability to brace properly um so you look at it, your the step up video that's fantastic because the core lateral glute everything has to work to step up so you're getting a lot of transfer in stabilizing that hip so that's what i mean about um say if you're looking at bilateral like a squat you're not getting that stability around the hip that you would get with a step up Mm. So if you're only looking at um, uh, bilateral work versus unilateral, that's the little stabilizing support that it gets to the muscle groups that probably are stim- under stimulated if you don't have a good program. Mm, totally. So I so say the, the areas that I think get neglected is just one that you touched on uh, calf. I think just be able to have calf strength, but also calf, calf endurance as well. And, and what I mean by that is being able to do single leg calf raises to say let's in a slow motion, like two seconds up, two seconds down and being able to at least do say 12, just pretty reasonably easy. Um, if you struggle with that, I think you just don't have that calf strength endurance for rugby, but then also doing it in a, in a bit faster motion as well for, for a lot higher numbers. And I think that's 
something people forget because they say, oh, I don't really have big calves, so I don't really train them. It's like, well, even if you got small calves, still train them. They're, they're still working. They might not be that big, but they're still still definitely working. Um, yeah, and size I'll, doesn't matter for that. It's yeah. that the ability, yeah, the conditioning, isometric, and the, the ability to withstand a really high, quick impulse mm. that takes a lot of pressure off your Achilles and so mm. forth. So, and I'd also talk about the feet as well. It's probably something everyone isn't probably aware of in um, up and coming in, in most sports. It's probably something that you get taught a bit later on in, in programs in, in higher level programs. So definitely doing some feet conditioning, which is a big focus of the uh, becoming a beast program um, for the, for listeners who haven't unlocked those uh, exercises yet. Doing some movements barefoot in the gym is a, is a really big step as well. So deadlifting and squatting just barefoot is a really good way to activate those foot muscles, but also making sure that you're putting force evenly for that foot um, and not squatting with some really thick um, rubber as well. And I would expect you have um, something to say about that as well. Yeah, I won't say it depends. (laughs) Um, Also, before we go that way, I was thinking too, a lot of isometric single leg work on hamstrings where your actual core is involved and your, your knee is at um, 20 degrees. So for, for that foot strike position when you're really running fast. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's pretty neglected as well. I think um, that's something you need to learn as you as you get better because that really keeps you in that game and gives you the ability to have quite healthy mm-hmm. hamstrings. So it's not all, you know, just... Uh, eccentric work, it's that isometric at the correct angles for your hamstring. Mm. Um, yeah, feet conditioning, absolutely. Yeah, it's important. I guess the way I like to think about it is if you're just wearing shoes around all the time, it's like you're wearing mittens, right? Mm. So you take the mittens off uh, and then start going around the world. All the muscles in your hands are going to hurt. All the muscles along your calf, we're pretending here, start hurting because they, they haven't been stimulated. They really yeah. haven't. They've been in the mittens for long periods of time. So um, even if that's in your socks when you're doing your foot conditioning type of work, um, there's, and depending on your gym rules, you know, doing some your single leg work or your warm up components of your squat um, without shoes on, really good. But that just be safe in there and make sure you know your gym rules because some gyms, yeah. gyms don't like. It. And don't be dropping weights on your toes as well. So please be safe. Yeah. So coming up to our final question is, is something that I've been seeing uh, quite a bit on Instagram um, and it just refers to squat depth. So what is the ideal range for rugby athletes without saying it depends? So for me, um, over the years, what I look for is their lower back position. So the correct depth for you will change based on where you put your feet, what you do, um, how long your torso is, how long your femurs are, and so forth. But if you want to know what is your correct depth, uh, video yourself squatting and just take a look at your lower back. Just make sure you've got that natural curve. As soon as you round, either you need to adjust the type of squat you're doing or you're going too deep for you. So the correct depth is one where your lower back holds its integrity in that correct position. So that's what you look for. You can't say, you know, it's 90 degrees, it's your, your, your hip lower than your knee. Everyone is uniquely different, okay? And where you manip- how you manipulate your squat should all be based on where your lower back is and keeping that natural curve in your lower back. Mm. What are your thoughts? I think I would agree with that and also add on to it that for, for depth, it's going to change over the off-season, pre-season, in-season. For me, I'm trying to promote a, a deep squat and in that off-season just to try and get that full range. As I tell my I tell athletes is we want the full range to get the full muscle um, because I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of seeing these, just to say, for instance, shoulder pressure is just coming down a little bit and then going up. So I want that full range of motion. And, and then once we're getting a bit more specific towards in the pre-season, that's where we're just going to parallel or for my taller um, individuals to arrange that they feel comfortable and it's just like you said it's just looking at that lower back region and making sure they're not doing that little butt wink as we as a lot of people refer it to and just getting them to a, a range that feels comfortable for them 
but then they can also maximize their um, force output in that position. And then in the in season, you can just do sort of those partial squats and really load it up and really get a good stimulus on the nervous system and, and really go above your one RM um, something I have played around in the past as well. Just um, something a bit different, but yeah, for me, it's starting off low and then sort of just manipulating and playing around with the squat depth. But I think it does come back to that individual and their natural curve of their spine and what, what is comfortable and what, what works for them as well. And I should qualify that a little bit more as well, saying that um, under low load or not much load, like your, your body can hold uh, your lower back doing some slightly different things. As you're loading it up, uh, just don't sacrifice that. Um, you, you, your lower back, your back in particular, it's really important if you can look after it. Let's let's do that because um, the squat work is there to make you stronger. Mm. Okay, that's its role. Um, you know, like we can people can start arguing over inches rather than the actual outcome of making your lower body strong mm, totally so any final thoughts before we wrap this episode up today ben yeah you probably we probably need to expand on each one of those topics that we've talked about i think that then mm. in the future i think you can almost spend uh you know a good hour on each topic i think we'll break it off but it'd be great to know what um people would like to know so mm. if some people have some questions and so forth, just uh, message us directly, make some comments if you feel like you, you're brave enough to make comments. But if you just want to um, message us as well, that's great as well. We're yeah, looking you're... for what you, we can do to help. Mm. If the, yeah, if there's a topic or just a question that we briefly answered and you want more information, do reach out to us and we can spend an episode um, going more in depth on that top, topic as well. So thanks for everyone for tuning in to episode five today. So remember to like, subscribe, and also rate um, Elite Rugby SNC on Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. Sign up today to become a beast via the link in the description or via Instagram page. So don't wait. Make that good decision and join the Elite Rugby SNC program and take your game to the next level. So thanks, everyone, and thank you, Ben. Thanks, Kieran. I'll catch you soon. See ya.